My guest today is a brilliant heart surgeon, veteran of more than 30,000 operations. But his growing international reputation rests less on his medical skill, more on his business brain. He wants to do for major surgery what Henry Ford did for the motor car, make it affordable for the masses by way of mass production. He's building what he calls medical cities across India and beyond. But can this vision of delivering a public good for private profit really change healthcare around the world? Dr. Devi Shetty, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. First basic question. Do you see yourself first and foremost as a doctor or a businessman? Always a doctor, always as a heart surgeon, never as a businessman. Although you spend a huge amount of your time doing deals, traveling the world, negotiating contracts, not actually in the operating theater. Uh, it's very interesting, Steve. I see about 60 to 80 heart patients a day, and I do at least two or three heart surgeries a day. And I work for about 16 to 18 hours. When you're in the... I mean, how, how much time do you have to, because of your business and your desire to expand, how much time do you actually spend away from your day job in the operating theatre? Uh, I guess I travel once or twice a uh, month. Uh, most of the time I'm in the hospital, but I do see patients in other parts of the country with the video conferencing, telemedicines. I always participate in uh, various lectures through uh, uh, virtual presence. I, I want to take you back in a way to discover how you got into the business of healthcare as well as the practice on a day-to-day -day basis inside the operating theatre. When was it that you first decided, you know what, I'm, I'm not entirely satisfied by the surgery I'm doing, I want, to, I want to go further? I left England in 89 and I started, I used to work at the Guy's Hospital in London as a heart surgeon. I started my career in Calcutta and I used to see about 60 to 100 patients a day at the end of the day, no patient came for operation because they couldn't afford it. If a solution is not affordable, it's not a solution. So that's the time me and my colleagues, we decided that we have to do something to reduce the cost. You mean you, couldn't, you felt you couldn't deliver enough of a public good, despite the skills you patently had as a heart surgeon, you couldn't do what you wanted to do because not enough people could afford your service. Exactly. Even today, Steve, 100 years after the first heart surgery, less than 10% of the world's population can afford heart operation. Forget about heart operation, even joint replacement or a major cancer operation, less than 10% of the world's population can afford it. 90% of the world's population are silent bystanders. If they suffer from illness, they're going to die. I just wonder whether the fact that for a time, late in her life, you were giving treatment and, and acting as physician to Mother Teresa, did that have any impact upon your view of what a healthcare system should look like? It had a major impact on everything uh, what I did. Six years of my life with Mother, towards the end of her life, left behind a very, very major uh, impact on everything what we did. She gave us a simple solution to complex problems. So there we are, a woman who influenced you a great deal, a deeply spiritual woman, a woman who devoted her life to the poor. And yet, when you decided to launch your own business venture in the healthcare system, it has to be said that the profit motive underpinned everything you did. Uh, not exactly, Steve. First of all, charity is not scalable. If you're going to do free, if you're going to offer free healthcare, there is a limit to which you can offer. But if you use your business skills and reduce the cost, then you can offer healthcare to the whole world. I, when I started my career in India, heart surgery was costing 150,000 uh, rupees. And 20 years later, we brought it down to 60,000 to 70,000, virtually half. 
and this transformation didn't happen on its own. But it's a, a very carefully calibrated model that you use, isn't it? Because you have to pull in enough full fee patients, if I can put it that way, to allow you the economic freedom then to allow big discounts and sometimes completely free treatment to those who simply cannot afford to pay. So you have to get the balance right. Exactly. All we need is 40% of the patients to pay the regular uh, rack rate and 60% of the patients can pay less than the regular rack rate and some people pay nothing. But doesn't that mean you overcharge those who have the ability to pay? No. You just... Every country well, has... Because they're paying for everybody else. I mean, it's a sort of socialized system in which the, the, ri the rich have to pay for the poor. And I just wonder whether the rich, your clients who have plenty of money, and goodness knows in India today there are lots of them, <laughs> whether they're entirely satisfied by this. No, they never pay the premium. They pay as much as they pay in other hospitals. And that money is good enough for us to subsidize the care. I'll give an example. It's all about controlling the costing. We have a concept of producing a profit and loss account in our hospital on a daily basis. We control money. Every day at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, all the doctors, all the senior administrators get an SMS with the profit and loss account, EBITDA margin, what is the revenue, what is the loss for the previous day. So we control the cost. So, so well, hang on, hang on. This is extraordinary. You're saying that whatever a doctor is doing on a, in your hospital, he is going to be interrupted at midday with a financial report on the last 24 hours of activity inside the business, i.e. the hospital. It just seems an extraordinary way of treating your doctors. Aren't they supposed to be treating patients? If the doctors are not given the financial information, there is no way you will be able to reduce the cost of health care. Because ultimately they are the ones, there are 10 different ways to treat a problem. And the outcomes are more or less the same. So a doctor has a choice to decide which is the best way. And if you do not educate the doctors to understand the financial implications of the care, you forget about reducing the cost. It will never happen. I mean, this is a fascinating model you are describing because in healthcare systems across the world right now, there is a profound debate about whether doctors themselves should be the ones to make the key financial decisions. We have it here in the British National Health Service right now with the present government arguing that doctors should in future take key financial decisions, management decisions about the shape of the healthcare system. You're saying that f for you, the doctors have to be at the center of financial management. Exactly. The, if you have to teach a finance man about medicine, it may take his whole life. Whereas a doctor, a financial I information system can be taught to him in a few days. But you are compromising the doctor's focus on <laughs> the job that they swore the Hippocratic Oath to carry out, which is to care for their patients. Doctor has dual responsibility. When you ask me, what my job is, I typically describe myself as my job is putting price tag on human life. You may think, what job I am doing? I, every day I see 30 to 40 kids sitting on the mother's lap, and I tell the mother, he requires operation, and the, mother, the first question the mother asks is, how much is it going to cost? I tell her it's going to cost 60,000 rupees. And that is a price tag I put on the child's life, because the mother doesn't have 60,000. So this is a situation we are in India. Every doctor in this world is facing today that his patient can't afford. Now, unless the doctor develops the knowledge to control the cost, he will never be able to deliver the care. Here are some downsides I can see to your approach. I mean, you in the past have talked about bringing the Henry Ford attitude to healthcare, that is creating a sort of economy of scale through mass production, in a sense through the industrialization of even the most sort of sophisticated surgery and, and healthcare techniques. I can understand what you're saying, but I can also, also see major problems. For example, number one, you treat your surgeons very much as sort of shop floor workers. You want them to do two, three, maybe even more major operations per day. Is that really in the best interest of either doctor or patient? You should ask the surgeons this question. We have virtually 0% attrition among our senior doctors. We can afford to hire any doctor. They would give their right and their left hand to work for our organization because they enjoy working. The, some of the doctors we have, they have one of the largest series in the world in doing that operation. G given a choice to the surgeons, 
they would like to be in the operating room operating from morning till night they don't want to do anything else so this is the kind of environment you create you give the freedom to the doctors to do whatever they want what about um, the notion that you're very interested in those uh, aspects of medicine which clearly offer you opportunity for scaling up and frankly for profit I'm thinking about the obvious things heart care cardiac yes. surgery is an obvious one because that's your own specialism but cancer would be another because it's so prevalent in, yes. in the modern world but there must be lots of much rarer diseases and conditions which can't be scaled up where frankly you're probably going to be much less interested in devoting your doctor's time and attention to we are in the entire sphere of healthcare Steve. we are we run the primary health care of some of the uh, uh, very important regions of our state, especially the backward regions. Yeah, but can you afford to specialize in these much less profitable aspects of, of modern medicine where you can't scale up? The, we are not really concerned about, like the primary health care, there is one particular state where there is very poor primary health care. We offer the primary health care to those villages. We see about 40 to 50,000 patients on a regular basis, entirely free. We don't look at making money at every level. All we are trying to do is to keep our nose above water. You do have uh, huge hospitals. I mean, your, your original pioneering hospital in Bangalore, I believe, has more than 1,000 beds just devoted to your cardiac unit. Yes. In, I see in America the average number of beds in a specialist heart unit would be 160. Is it really in the patient's interest to have these vast medical factories? We need to do 2.5 million heart surgeries a year in my country. All the heart hospitals in the country put together perform less than 90,000 surgeries. And if we build large hospitals, we can reduce the cost significantly. More than that, your outcomes are always better than a hospital doing less number of operations. Statistically, it has been proved that a large hospital doing large number of procedures has much better outcomes than a hospital doing small number of procedures. Just a, a few short weeks ago, we saw a terrible incident in Calcutta, a private yes. hospital, a big, important private hospital with a, a terrible blaze, more than 90 people killed, and it raised serious questions about the standards in some Indian privately run hospitals. I just wonder, as you get bigger, and we're going to talk about your ambitious expansion plans, are you sure that you can maintain the standards that you say you believe in? As you get bigger, it becomes relatively easier for you to maintain standards. I'll give an example. Well, it gets harder for you to actually know what's going on in every single hospital that you control. The, uh, we have an information system, uh, Steve. Any, pro any employee or any patient has any unhappy experience or something not right, all they do is to press a, a, a f speed dial number which goes to the patient complaint system for the entire group. So the, uh, when you have large numbers, you can put in all these sophisticated systems. Let's now talk about how far your ambition can go. Already in this indiv interview, you've sort of implied to me that you believe what you have developed here is a model which has application across India and maybe even across the developing and maybe even the developed world as well. I just wonder whether your ambition is really matched by reality. You already talked about the huge challenges in India, it seems to me the biggest challenge of all in India is, is that poverty is still a huge phenomenon across the country. I mean, it, hundreds of millions of people living on two dollars a day or less. One fifth, I believe, of all the children in the world who die under five years old die in India. Isn't that yes. a much bigger problem than developing sophisticated heart and cancer hospitals? It's a relatively easy solu uh, uh, problem to be solved in a country like India, primarily because we produce the largest number of doctors, nurses, and medical technicians in the world. And we run a health insurance. We started off with uh, uh, about 1.7 million farmers. Today we have 4 million farmers. They pay just 22 cents per month. We started with uh, 5 cents per month. So we gradually increase the premium and we run a health insurance where 4 million farmers just by paying 22 cents per month can have a heart operation, brain operation, cancer operation, everything done. But do you take my point that 
in some ways, for you as a very articulate and influential voice within Indian healthcare, you might be.